Thank you for tuning in to the 2021 Mineral Symposium of the Pacific Northwest Chapter of Friends of Mineralogy. This is our second annual virtual symposium due to the current health restrictions because of the ongoing global pandemic, so we're glad that you're able to join us here. Our 2021 theme for the symposium is Minerals of Africa, and our first speaker is Bruce Cairncross of Johannesburg, South Africa. Bruce obtained his master's degree from the University of Natal in 1979, and after working as a geologist with the Rand Mines Limited uh, Coal Division, he joined the University of Witwatersrand Rand and obtained his PhD in 1986. He then joined uh, the Rand's Afrikaans University, RAU, geology department where he served as the head of the department for 14 years from 2003 to 2016, during which time RAU merged with the Witwatersrand Technicon to form the University of Johannesburg. And he is currently professor of geology at the University of Johannesburg. Bruce is a prolific author and has, co -auth has authored 11 books on South African minerals and gemstones and over 150 articles on the same subject. He serves on the editorial boards of the Mineralogical Record and Rocks and Minerals magazine, and many of his articles have, have appeared in those two magazines. He is an accomplished photographer and, is, uh, and has won local and international awards for his photographs. And now here is Bruce Karen Cross with the first of his two talks, the Kalahari Manganese Field, South Africa's most famous mineral locality. Thanks, Julian, for that introduction. Um, I appreciate it. And it's um, a great pleasure for me to be able to speak today on um, South Africa's um, greatest locality for minerals. Um, I think that is unquestionable. We do have other interesting deposits here, but the Kalahari Manganese Field is um, certainly uh, the prime locality. And I look forward to giving my talk to you today. Thank you. Okay, the Kalahari Manganese Field, South Africa's most famous mineral locality. Um, as I said, um, I, I believe that to be true. Um, certainly the greatest variety of minerals have come from the Kalahari Manganese Field. And uh, there are also some other famous aspects about uh, this deposit of manganese, which I'll also be talking about during the course of my presentation. <clears throat> I would like to, however, before we get into it, acknowledge certain people and organizations, because this isn't a sole job, so to speak. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a joint effort. And firstly, um, ASOL, which is Associated Ore, um, and ASMANG, Associated Manganese, and uh, the chairman of ASOL, Mr. Desmond Sacco, I'd like to thank him. My fellow academics, Professors Nick, Nick Bjorkus and Jens Gutzma, who are the experts on the geology and the genesis of the Kalahari Manganese Field and their postgraduate students. And then my good friend, Paul Ballier, who um, during the early 2000s had a contract to mine for minerals at the Enchwining Mine. And I'll be showing you some of the specimens that he produced. And then also some of the other collectors and the museums who have allowed me to photograph their specimens. I'm indebted to all of these people. And then as it also forms part of my research, the funding agencies, um, SAMIRA, which is the Department of Science and Innovation National Research Foundation Center of Excellence, and the National Research Foundation as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge those for my funding for part of my research. Okay, so the structure of my talk, I'd like to give a brief history um, of uh, the Kalahari Manganese Fields, how it was discovered and when. And then just very briefly talk about the geology, which is quite complex. And then because of the time frame, um, we can't do an A to Z of all the minerals. So I thought I would focus on some of the iconic things, rhodochrosite, and then I've got others, which I'll be showing. And then in the last 20 years, in the 21st century, um, speak a little bit about the Shigite and the Olmite, and then just a couple of the type locality species. So that's um, the route we're going to take. So first of all, where is the Kalahari Manganese Field? He has a Google Earth image of South Africa. Um, there's a scale by here, 500 kilometers. He has Pretoria and Johannesburg. So about 600, 650 kilometers to the west, southwest of Johannesburg 
is where the manganese fields are located. So they are here. It's in what's called the Northern Cape province and um, just south of Botswana. And it's basically a fairly semi-arid climate, although there is obviously rainfall in the area. So that's the locality. So some very brief history. Um, there is very little outcrop in the Kalahari manganese fuel area at all. So um, it's quite interesting how these deposits were originally discovered, as most of them are beneath the cover of the Kalahari sand. So in the early 1900s, um, some of the geologists working for the South African Geological Survey um, were mapping in the area, notably Rogers, and he was the first to recognize and to um, see the manganese deposits at Black Rock. Now, Black Rock is the only outcrop in the Kalahari manganese field on surface, and it's a small hill, um, black for obvious reasons, manganese and iron ore. And uh, if it wasn't for that outcrop, uh, there probably would be a very different history to the development of these deposits. But nonetheless, um, he, he mapped these, although at the time there wasn't any demand for manganese. And then for the next 20 odd years, various other reports were done because there's also iron ore in the area. And um, more reports were written by some notable geologists, uh, Schoen and Hall and others. But it wasn't until the late 1920s when a young Italian geologist, mining engineer, Guido Sacco, came to South Africa seeking his fortune. And um, <clears throat> as part of his work as a geologist, mining engineer, um, he recognized the potential of some of these deposits in the Northern Cape. And to the south of the Kalahari manganese field is what uh, has been called the Posmasberg uh, field. And that's also manganese iron deposits. And Guido Sacco formed a company, Gloucester Manganese Mines, in that area and uh, started the mining there. And it was in 1940 when... Um, Further to the north, which is in the Kalahari area, Kalahari manganese fields, he um, they opened up the Black Rock Mine and Asmang was formed. So Guido Sacco, the father of the current chairman of ASOR, Desmond Sacco, played a pivotal role in the discovery of these deposits. And again, Black Rock, the outcrop, was critical because that's where you can actually see these economic beds exposed on surface. From a specimen standpoint, history of discovery, the first rhodochrosites um, were found in the, um, uh, the early 1960s, and they came from the hot as hell mine. And now that's a bit of a play on words for hot as hell because it can get very hot in the area. But so the first ones came from that mine, the open cast mine, um, and, but not in great abundance. And then a year later, um, in the southern part of the manganese field, and I'll show you a map in a while, the Mamatuan open cast mine was opened by a company, Samanco, South African Manganese Corporation. And then eight years after that, um, the other company, Asmang, Associated Manganese, opened the Enchwining One mine. And Samanco, the opposition company, right next door to Enchwining, the year later, in 73, opened the Vessels mine. And these two mine names, I think, are familiar to mineral collectors. Um, and then uh, the Entwining 2 mine was opened um, by Asmang. And in 2003-04, the opening of the Entwining 3 shaft took place, the Asmang, also one of the Asmang mines. Now, you'll notice that up till this stage, there's virtually only two players in the game, Samanco and Asmang. And that is the case. But with the new political dispensation that came to South Africa in 1994, uh, Ten years later, a new Minerals Act was passed, where all the mineral rights reverted to the state. And this then opened up um, pathways for uh, a number of new companies to start entering the playing field of the manganese mines. And um, a number of these are actually black empowerment companies as well. And I'll show you some of those in a short while. So here's two uh, postcard type of pictures of some of the early history. This is the Devon mine. Now, some of these names may not be familiar because these are mining what's called low-grade ore, and they don't produce much in the way of mineral specimens. But that's the open pit mine, the Devon mine. 
And here on the right is the Adams mine, and both actually open cast. So some of the ore bodies just below the cover sand are quite close to surface, but some are underground. So on the left, here's the first geological, detailed geological map of the Black Rock Hill uh, from Boardman, 1940. So this is the map, and there's a scale up at the top here that's actually 600 feet. So that's about 200 meters. So you can see it's not a very large hill. And it outcrops uh, at the triple point junction of three farms, Belgravia, Santoy, and Nzhuaning. So Nzhuaning mines take their name after the farm name where uh, they are located. And in fact, the trig beacon on the hill is right at the triple point of these three farms. So that's the first geological map. And if you can just see the scale, uh, the, uh, the legend down here, you can see there's black lines which says hematite or ferruginous manganese and manganese ore. So the Black Rock Mine was actually an incline shaft coming in the side of the hill here. So the next slide is going to be a view at ground level, looking towards the hill here. So at the top is a historical shot of uh, the Black Rock Hill here in the distance. So you can see it's not big. He has a farm in the foreground. This is pre-World War II. And here's a photograph I took a few years ago of exactly the same view, except now you can see there are some openings in the side of Black Rock, and that's where the declines were going in of the Black Rock mine. So, if we're looking at some history, and this is quite a busy uh, slide, but I'd just like to explain, um, it, it, it shows the opening of the various mines over time and the companies who own them and whether they are open pit or not. So here is the time scale from 1935 up until 20, just after 2015. Not much has changed up to now. Um, these gray dots show that it's an open pit mine and the black squares are underground. So you'll see some like hot as hell here yeah, was both open pit and then went underground, whereas some here are only actually underground. And again, if you look at the company names, Asbank Samanco, Asbank Samanco, one, this is all pre-2004. And then here, we start seeing the appearance of some of the other companies, UMK, Khalakhadi, JP, Enetle, et cetera, who are now um, active in uh, the manganese fields. From a mineral standpoint, uh, the names that are familiar are Hot as Hell Mine, uh, Enchwining One and Vessels, Enchwining Two, and Enchwining Three. Now, and you can see the time that they opened. So here's the Hot as Hell Mine opening here, sort of in uh, the late 1950s, and here's Enchwining One, as I said, in the, in the early 1970s. And the other thing to notice is the color of these lines. That's referring to low grade, the blue line, and high grade ore, the red line, because there's two different types of ore in the manganese field. And obviously, just by their notation, the mines would like to go for high grade ore. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So at the moment, um, from 1940 up until uh, two years ago, 22 mines operating in the area. And that may still be give or take one operation, uh, the current scenario. So now what's this about low grade and high grade ore? Because that ties directly into the mines and into our minerals that we are interested in. So if you look at the manganese ore, <clears throat> low grade ore has got 32, 38 weight percent manganese metal in it. Now you'll see this is called primary sedimentary Mamatuan type ore, that's named after the Mamatuan open cast mine. The high grade ore, which is called the vessels type after the vessels mine, 42 to 68 percent manganese metal. So obviously, if you're mining, that's what you would like to get, because although the low grade ore is ironed, is, is mined, you obviously need to move more tons to get uh, the metal percentage. And you have just a quote out of um, our one book, the Kalahari Manganese Field, it's the largest land-based resource of manganese in the world, land-based, because there is manganese uh, nodules on the ocean floors, but land-based with some about 77% of the world's resource. So economically, for South Africa, uh, manganese, like gold and like platinum, uh, is, is actually critical 
to um, our exports and our and our um, economy. Okay, so yeah, to put it into perspective, is a oblique Google Earth image to show you the mines in the Kalahari manganese field. So the town of Kuruman, which is um, the closest town, is just off the picture down here to the southeast. But here's the Mama Twan mine, the first one to open, open cost. And here's Adams, here's the Bordwell project. And as you go up north towards Botswana, the smart mine, Perth, there's hot as hell, which you see is a bit of a distance away from the ones right up in the north, the Enchwining and the Vessels and Black Rock. And in between is Gloria Mine. So just to look at, um, we'll look at this main part. That's what we're going to be concentrating on really for the rest of my talk. Um, and here's a close-up of it. So you can see here's Enchwining 1 and 2, and here's Enchwining 3, Black Rock. There's that hill there, and there's the Vessels Mine. So the decline for Enchwining 1 is just in this corner over here where there's a decline where you go down. The shaft here is for entwining two, and then there's another shaft for entwining three. And there's a decline from entwining surface, from entwining two surface here that goes down underground, and that can that connects then with entwining three. So here's a photo a couple of years ago uh, of um, the Mama Twan mine, open cast mine, uh, mining low grade ore. <clears throat> now it's interesting because. A while ago, we had a series of commemorative stamps in South Africa that commemorated the important economic geology deposits that we have here, gold, diamonds, manganese. And this was the manganese. This, this is the stamp for manganese, MN. This is in 1984. And in fact, on the stamp is depicted the mine you see in the back. So open pit mama twine with a blast going, quite dramatic. And in the foreground is manganite. But now, those of you who know Kalahari manganese field manganite and manganite from Ilfeld in Germany should see there's a bit of a problem here because the artist obviously went to some book and found and searched for manganite and found a picture and he painted it onto his stamp. But of course, that's not <laughs> Kalahari manganese field manganite specimen. That's one from Germany. So that's a bit of um, an a philatelic oxymoron, if you like. It's, uh, it was quite funny when it came out. Of course, only geologists and mineralogists would know that. All right, here's the road going from Kuruman up to Hotezel. And as you can see, it's rather flat, very little outcrop. Um, there is some off to the left, but that doesn't have too much to do with the manganese field. So rather flat terrain in this, um, in this Kalahari area. It's not always hot and dry. Here's a photo Paul Ballier took in 2008 with torrential rain. That's the headgear of entwining two through the pouring rain. So it's not always as dry as a desert, but it can get exceptionally hot there, over 45 degrees in the summer. So here's an aerial photograph of Black Rock that I took when we were doing the fieldwork for our second book. So you can see the hill here, and um, it's rather pockmarked. And in the foreground is the village of the mine village of actually Black Rock. And the twining three is just off to the left. So my next slide is going to be taken down this decline, this edit here, where you go down and have a look at the old workings, because the Black Rock mine has been closed for a long time. So here is a view of that. And these are the supporting pillars you can see underground. And <clears throat> without a person for scale, you wouldn't realize the enormity of these. There's a a man down there for scale is absolutely enormous pillars that are left holding up. Notice the steep dip of the strata, and I'll show you in the geology why that is in uh, a short while. So um, this is the old Black Rock mine, closed. So this is the Enchwining 2 mine headgear um, with some of the conveyor belts handling the ore, and Enchwining, the farm name, well, one of the type species is Enchwiningite. It's this manganese silicate and it's these it's quite small these sort of uh, fibrous puff balls of entwiningite so that's the entwining mine that's the vessels mine right next door um, now uh, owned it, it it was owned by Samanco and then by south 32 and so the two different companies own the mines but underground they are they mine the identical ore body it's only on surface that there are two different organizations involved 
So that's the vessel's mind, it's headgear. And that is the vessel site, which is the type mineral named after the vessel's mine where it comes from. And it's uh, strontium copper silicate, and it occurs in the suvilite assemblage of minerals. So those are some of the mines. So let's look briefly at some of the geology. It's um, my colleagues, Gutzma and Nick Birkus, and as I said, their students, they are the main players in this. But I'd just like to show you some of it and also explain why we get the minerals we do because of the geology. And just on this map in the background, you can see there's this Black Ridge thrust over here. That's very important, and I'll show you that in a while. All right. Um, <clears throat> It, it looks busy, but I'll explain. Um, here's a, a vertical column through the succession that contains the manganese. There's a scale, so that's 20 meters. It's quite simple. There's a central part, which is called the hot as hell formation, and it's underlain by a volcanic succession called the ongeluk lavas, unlucky lavas, and it's overlain by um, dolomite and limestone, which is called the moi dry. There's a lot of African names here, moi dry, which literally means pretty turn. So underlain by volcanics, overlain by a dolomitic succession. And in the middle are the chemical sediments of the Artisel formation. And on the right-hand side here are all the different types of rocks, depending on their composition. And there are a variety of names, hematite, lutite, brownite, lutite, etc. So I've just put a picture on either side each of these is a piece of polished drill core, just to show you some of what these different rocks actually, what they look like. So, for example, he has the jasperlite, uh, he has a braunite lutite, which is another word for a, a mudstone rich in braunite. Uh, he has the iron formation, which is basically hematite and some jasper. So those are what, what the rocks actually, what they look like. If you look at the manganese, there are three manganese beds or units there's this MN1, which is the thickest one, and that's the main ore body that's mined. And then there are two thinner ones above that may or may not be mined in the future. It depends. But in Twining and Vessels and all the other mines, mine this lower unit that you see down here. Okay, so here's the important thing, structure, the structural evolution of this deposit. So this is a cross-section from east to west. So from that entwining one mine, which is over here, the decline gang, all the way across here to Black Rock. There's the Black Rock Hill. So the red here is the continuous hot as hell formation that would, at the time of its formation, been continuous layers like icing in a cake, but now has been structurally disturbed by two structural events. And the one are normal faults, where we have down throw into these deeper graben structures, and notice the scale, that's 500 meters, and that's a kilometer. So we're looking at several kilometers here. So there are these normal faults, but then over in the west, due to compressional tectonics, when the ancient craton of South Africa collided with a more westerly craton, thrust faults developed, and parts of the hot as hell formation were thrust up under this tremendous pressure, this tectonic pressure, to form these slices or slivers that we now see on surface. And that is the outcrop of the Black Rock Hill. So without these thrust faults, everything would still be buried underground. And yes, perhaps in the future with geophysics or whatever or something, drilling would have happened to actually find these deposits, but that would have only have happened much later. So th this tectonic feature um, is critical in the early discovery of these deposits. And just while we're on this particular section, you can see I mentioned he has a decline at Nchwining 2, which goes down and connects at the bottom of the shaft of Nchwining 3. But essentially, and vessels, which is just further off the picture, is mining the same ore body. So here's sort of a view. It's not quite east to west, but I'm standing, there's, there's the beacon at the triple point of the three farms, and I'm standing here towards um, having a look towards the east. So there's Entwining 3 headgear. There in the distance is beyond the sand dump in the distance is Entwining 2. And there is the vessels mine. And here is um, the Black Rock uh, Hill. Okay. Um, that high grade ore and low grade ore. 
This map, the details aren't really critical, but it's just showing all of the farms and actually showing the post-2004 players involved down here. You see the different companies. But what I want to show is this outline in red, this dashed line. And you'll see a large proportion of it, this area here, is low-grade manganese ore. Remember that 30-odd percent. And then up here in the north is the high-grade ore. That's the 40-plus ore. And so there's this zone up here, and that's no coincidence. That's where Enchwining and Vessels Mine are located, whereas all these others, Smart and the others, and Mamatuan are down south here in the low-grade ore. There are little pockets of high-grade ore, for example, here at Hot as Hell, and that's why that mine's there, and also here. Um, so th those, that's the high-grade and the low-grade. But how did that come about? Um, this diagram that I've taken out of um, our book um, attempts to show that. And again, there's a lot of elements in this, but I just, and, and we don't have to be worried too much about the details. But to start with, it, it begins, it be, the story begins on the top left, and we work our way down, left to right, left to right, up into the present day here. So originally, 2,200 million years ago, we have the deposition in this very ancient sea of the chemical sediments of the manganese and the iron deposits. So we have this sedimentary succession. And that's the original low-grade mamatuan type ore. And then since then, because this has been in a, in a geologically active area since uh, the Paleoproterozoic, there's been a number of uh, tectonic events, structural events, uh, hydrothermal events, erosion, folding, etc. through time. And one of these here is called the Vessels Ore Forming Event. Now, there's very specific dates here, 1045 to 1010 million years ago. And in fact, that's because of the work done by Norse and Arden Brewster and Villa, who dated Sujolite using argon argon and Nordeschite, and they got these absolute ages. So we know there was this event when we formed Sujolite, amongst other things. And it's this event that upgraded through various hydrothermal and geological processes, the original low-grade ore was actually high-graded upwards into the high-grade ore. So that's an important event from an economic standpoint. Then again, there was another one, about 550, what's called the Gloria event, um, where there was movement of fluids along those fault lines I showed you. Then there was even a younger one, and I'll come to this in a while, 40 to 90 million years ago. Um, and then even more recent, um, where there's this super gene ore formation during the Cenozoic. But from an economic and a mineralogical standpoint, these, these two here, and especially the vessels one, is uh, the important event of upgrading the ore. So let's just have a look at that. <clears throat> so I've just put that little block there. Here are two slides uh, actually taken underground sort of to symbolize it's, it's believed that the fluids moved up along the fault planes, and as they moved out, so they leached and re-precipitated um, the higher grade ore. And here's just some examples uh, of some of, uh, not on a fault, but here's a calcite vein, which is cutting through um, the ore body underground. And here's a vein of solid pyrite, uh, also cutting vertically through um, through the uh, through that main manganese ore body underground at uh, the Enchwining Mine. And there's a lot of brecciation involved. So here is a breccia uh, that's been, uh, you can see the, the uh, hematite and the manganese iron ore fragments that have been completely cemented by rhodochrosite. And obviously where there's an edge of a little vug, you get these small crystals. Now here's an interesting statistic. If we look at the number of mineral species that have been identified to the event, so, this is a histogram turned on its side. So on the, on the horizontal axis is um, the amount or the fraction of manganese ore in percentage, so up to 100%. And on the vertical axis, I've plotted some of those alteration events, you know, the ones that change in time. So here in blue is the original low-grade sedimentary ore. And you see that accounts for 80 plus 85% of all the ore in the Kalahari manganese field. Then there's that earlier metamorphic overprint, and then here's that high grade, the vessels event. Now, this is the high grade ore that is desirable, but it only accounts for 3% of the manganese ore. 
and these others are even less important. So the bulk of the ore by far is in the primary low-grade ore, a very small percentage in the high-grade ore. Okay. Now, how does this relate to the minerals? Well, if we look at the number of mineral species, and there's 147 known, only seven occur in the low-grade ore. Okay. And of the 3% of the high-grade ore accounts for over 140 of the mineral species. Now, obviously, there's some overlap. For example, brawnite occurs in the high grade as well as in the low grade. But it's, it just goes to show that how with the alteration event, vac formation, hydrothermal fluids, recrystallization, this generated by far the bulk of um, what we can call collectible minerals, but some of the others as well, even some of the, um, of the microscopic minerals. So that's um, an interesting corollary to actually to think about. Okay, so that's a bit about the history and the geology. So now let's move on to famous minerals. And uh, as I said, I'd like to feature the rhodochrosite and then just a few of the others. Um, the Calari manganese field rhodochrosite needs no introduction. Um, from the time it first appeared um, in the international shows, in fact, in Tucson, when it was first thought to be fake, um, that it was calcite somehow stained with cranberry juice, um, it, it's become an iconic species for any advanced collection um, in the world. And as you can see, it's been featured on covers of Lapis Monological Record. In fact, the Tucson show poster, 1986, that's the, uh, that's the Palmon uh, rhodochrosite that was on the poster. And this is a 24 carat uh, faceted specimen I had cut from a rough piece um, that wasn't well formed. So I decided to have it cut. Um, in, Peter, in Peter Bancroft's German Crystal Treasures book, um, which is published in 1984, um, he, he features the Calari manganese field and he quotes an interview he had with uh, what he, who he calls then the mine director in his book. And um, I've just repeated the quote here verbatim where the mine director was saying how they hit these jewel-like pockets a few hundred feet from the surface, virtually during the shaft sinking process. And it was associated with house moonlight, et cetera. The pockets were generally small, but some up to half a meter or a meter. Uh, and the largest recovered specimen weighed over 100 kilograms and is in the Pretoria Museum in South Africa. And in fact, that is it. I went to Pretoria Museum and I took a picture of it. So that's quite a large piece. It's about 45 centimeters and it certainly weighs. It's on this manganese ore and it is over 100 kilos. Here is one of the early hot as hell specimens um, uh, from the 1960s and it's gypsum with this sort of druzy rhodochrosite. It's very atypical to what is to come later from and twining one. So that is a hot as hell, early specimen. And here is another one, um, which also is from hot as hell and was acquired from the miner, a retired miner who worked at the mine. He didn't work at Nchwani. He was working for Samanko. So, and this does look a little bit like the later ones to come from hot as, uh, from Nchwani one. And these are, Yes, yeah, just a montage of some of the calorie manganese field rhodochrosites. And <clears throat> I think, I believe what makes them appealing to collectors, apart from the color, is the great diversity of habits and shapes and forms. Um, from on the left here, what's called the wheat sheaf, you can see here, and on the right, uh, spheres, perfect spheres of rhodochrosite, these dog's tooth, etc. So. Um, you can have a rhodochrosite in your collection, but you may only have one type. And that's often what makes uh, the challenge is trying to get all of the different varieties, especially in this day and age, it's because these don't come out like this nowadays. So yes, sort of the typical three uh, or rather four of the miniatures, these are four to five centimeters of the so-called dog's tooth, the scalenohedral. Um, and not crystals like this, but sometimes the massive lumps, which were partly jemmy, have been faceted, like, as I showed you just now, this particular 24.4 carat piece. 
Yes, some more here um, with the specimen in the background. These are three faceted stones. The one in the middle is actually 17 carats. And interestingly enough, these were part of a parcel acquired by the collector, and they were cut by Rock Courier at the time. In uh, uh, it is either the late 1970s, I think I was told. He has a large specimen. Well, eight, it's eight centimeters, a cluster, with um, small specks of manganite, the very common associate, and with uh, like snow caps of calcite, very druzy calcite. And I think perhaps um, it would have been more thickly coated and perhaps this has been mechanically, very carefully actually picked off. There's been some attempts to remove the calcite off these with acid, and um, it's not an easy job, and it's very easy because obviously both are carbonates that the rotor underneath can be damaged and etched. This is, um, it looks like the hot as L one, but this is a 16 centimeter from a Chwaning one. Um, and it's like the wheat sheaf, but it doesn't have the pink core in the middle. It's all jemmy and red uh, on the black manganite, very typical of these. I think I forgot to mention that they were collected uh, during those early stages of the mine during the mid 1970s. That's when the bulk came out. So here's another type. Um, it's got the core of the jemmy uh, red. This is again a 20 centimeter specimen, but then it's overgrown by the pink. And it's almost like a colorful form, almost like a broccoli type of rhodochrosite. Then this big piece, 31 centimeters, and it's actually the wheat sheaf habit. Uh, which are tightly packed together. Um, and it's one of the largest uh, that I've seen. And again, on the manganite. Um, all of these that I'm showing you are in private collections. This was a type uh, that came out once. It's rare. And in my caption, I've got two generations. Um, it's essentially, it's not easy to see here, but if one looks up close, there is the dog's tooth, the scalenohedral, and then it's overgrown by a second later generation with this, with the pinicoidal or, or flat termination. And the second overgrowth is a bit lighter. So sometimes you can see the phantoms of the earlier formed inside. And um, there were not many of these found. And this is um, an 11 centimeter specimen. And then here are uh, two giants of the rotors. Um, the Munich 2012 show was uh, had Africa as its theme. And um, I took this picture in the display case showing um, the Assol Limited corporate specimen, 25 by 30 centimeters here on the left. Uh, and on the right, the very famous snail. Um, so from this same exhibition, I actually took a close-up of it because I, it's probably um, taking calls to Newcastle. I'm sure you've all seen this, but this is the snail, which is in Bill Larson's collection. And it was when he last gave his talk that I heard, and uh, it's truly spectacular. It glows, virtually glows in the dark. So those are um, rhodochrosites, which I think are familiar, but there are some other types or habits that I'd just quickly like to show you. Um, the one type are these spheroidal or perfect spheres of um, usually pink rhodochrosite. Um, the Previous one, you know, the snail is the jemmy red, which has got terminations on it, but these are quite smooth. So this is a 12 centimeter specimen on manganite from collected in 1978. Then there's this specimen. I actually took this photo at the Tucson show in 1993 um, in a dealer's showcase. I can't remember who it was, um, but I took the picture of these. They're like two soft marshmallows that are touching Someone said it looks like they are kissing, and um, obviously from Nchuaning. And I noticed that in um, our Nchuaning article that I'll show you in a short while in the mineralogical record, that Wendell Wilson actually featured this piece, the exact same piece, and I saw in the caption it was credited to Caroline Manchester. But this I took in 1993. And here's another one at the Munich show in 2006, uh, perfectly trimmed, perfect. Sphere that's uh, a bit larger than a golf ball in size. Then there's this rather strange, almost like a mushroom, which in fact it is. There's like a stem underneath, sitting on this granular 
maybe rhodochrosite, manganocalcite, um, but these hemispheres rise up and they are jemmy red and they coated by tiny platelets of manganite. So that's quite an unusual form. This is an early specimen uh, from uh, the mid-1970s with uh, platy pink rhodochrosite in places aggregating into like little rosettes, sitting on uh, blue chalcedony on manganite. And that's a 7.6 centimeter specimen. Inter interestingly, um, rhombohedral rhodochrosite, for example, like the famous Colorado, variety, the rhombohedral forms are rare from the Kalahari manganese field. And when they do occur, they tend to be like this. They are pink and opaque and usually intergrown and interlocking crystals. This is a specimen coming from the vessels mine. <clears throat> then the Shigaite zone um, produced some interesting rhodos. Uh, he has a vug, uh, 5.2 centimeters. He's very elongate, extended. Uh, scalenohedral and they color zone. They go from like a uh, amber sherry color down to a pink. And it just happens to be there's a little she guy actually sitting in this folk. And this pink variety um, on the Sussex site, which looks almost like mold or ice cream that's melting on top of uh, the fibrous matrix. Uh, these curved a uh, vermiform looking almost like the well-known uh, horse saddle dolomite crystals. Um, this is, a, again, an, an early 1970s specimen from Entwining One. And this little chimney, I, it could be some sort of a pseudomorph. I don't know. It's a thumbnail. It's only 2.8 centimeters, but it's a hollow tube actually capped on top uh, from Entwining Two. And even smaller still, but interesting nonetheless, he has what appears to be almost like a farden of rhodo. The entire field of view is only 1.3 centimeters, but it, it's uh, an interesting tiny piece. This one, which is not a great showpiece and maybe shouldn't be shown when you're showing actually great things, but it's rhodochrosite associated with todorokite. It's this fibrous asbestiform uh, manganese mineral. And why I'm showing that is because um, it maybe can answer a question, when did the rhodochrosite form? Was it during the Vessels event? Was it during the Gloria event? Uh, when? Um, and, and how can we tell and how do we know for sure? Obviously, you have to date some things. Well, um, what has happened is that the Todorokite uh, from, the, from the smart mine has been dated, and that was used to uh, date this particular alteration event um, uh, with the fault batches. And some of the rhodo is actually intergrown with the Todorokite. So therefore, it must have been either contemporaneous or later, at least. So it looks as if the crystallization of the rhodochrosite. Now, whether one can extrapolate that to all or just this pink variety is debatable, but it may be it was really later on in the evolution of the Galarian manganese field. And just to remind you that the majority of these came from um, the Entwining One mine in uh, the mid-1970s. So a few other maybe famous minerals. He has the ice cream cone. This is about 12 centimeters across, cut in a horite. Um, which I think is probably quite well known. But well known, I'm sure, is the Ettringite. <clears throat> it's the best of the species from anywhere in the world. There's no doubt about that, these yellow crystals. The one on the left associated with calcite, <clears throat> excuse me, and the one on the right with the manganite. Looking somewhat like Ettringite is the Tormosite, but the difference is uh, Ettingard has got aluminium in it, Tormosite has not. And these are three small gemmy crystals in my collection, 10 millimeters. And again, these are the ones that come from the Kalari manganese field, the best of species for their size and color. And then, of course, the famous Sturmanite. Now, it's interesting, this is still a type species only ever found in the Kalari manganese field, but literally over the decades in the thousands. Um, and 
some of them alter over time. They appear to perhaps dehydrate. If you look at the formula, they've got 25 H2 on it, but varied. They are the hexagonal. He has a 14 centimeter hexagonal pistol. He has part of one the size of two thirds of the size of a brick. And he has the typical hexagonal ones. And this here is from the early 1980s, just after it was described as a new species by Dunn et al. And it's the form that doesn't have the prisms. It's got the diet pyramids actually together uh, without the prisms being present. Hausmanite, as I said earlier, with the postage stamp, this is the Kalahari Hausmanite, and it's not anything <laughs> like the ones that they that Britta showed on the stamp, but these pagoda, highly lustrous uh, Hausmanite crystals, largest ones up to 15 centimeters on edge, sometimes associated with beautiful orangey red andradite garnet, or like down here, pink datalite. Then hematite, this is the specimen of mine that Roger Dixon, the late Roger Dixon and I featured on the cover of our very first book. These hematites came from the vessels mine in the 1980s and they are distinctive. They are highly lustrous, individual crystals up to the size of dinner plates, partly coated by druzy andradite, often as floaters and associated with white barite and calcite. And, um, very, very fine hematites. Here's another odd hematite from the Vessels Mine, uh, a one of fine. These are pseudo-hexagonal columnar hematites. This is a 12 centimeter specimen and also associated with, like the other find earlier, with the druzy andradite, the red calcite, and interestingly, um, tiny balls of strontianite that fluoresce under ultraviolet light. Cutnohorite. Um, he has a 21 centimeter specimen that some people who have seen it say it looks just like an orchid, which actually probably is a fairly good comparison. Uh, it, then Innocite has come out periodically, but the best by far were, were the one of find in uh, the Vessels Mine, of which this is a small piece, showing these absolutely gemmy bladed crystals associated with snow white sprays of naturalite. Um, these were truly spectacular, and the color, that's true color. Um, there were others that came out from entwining more needle-like and more like cinnamon brown. And then prenite, um, interestingly, not like the green prenite from uh, Gobobose, but this orange prenite um, that we've analyzed, and it carries about 0.48% manganese oxide, which we believe is giving the orange color uh, to the prenite. This, again, was a one-off find. It's interesting, the minerals of the calorie manganese field, um, not the calcites, et cetera, but some of these things like the hematites, uh, uh, not the hematites, I beg your pardon, the prenites are found once and they never found again to date. It's, it's like a one-off find, which is kind of interesting. Celestine, these are from a twining three um, collected by Paul Ballier when he was winding there under contract, um, a 17 centimeter spray on matrix. These are interesting. Um, he was telling me that when you get them underground in the mine, they're absolutely colorless. And as you as you took them out to surface, as they came out into the sunlight, they immediately turned pale blue, irreversibly pale blue. And then this mineral, which um, <coughs> has an interesting history, chiselite, um, that was originally called Marshall Sussmanite, and then was subsequently, if you look at the publication down here by Grice et al., was um, renamed Shizzleite. It's basically grandfather because it already existed. Um, and these are three specimens I obtained at the time from the late John Vervart, when it was um, thought to be, first of all, Bustamite, and then various name changes occurred. But what I found intriguing was the information that was given for the labeling that these came from both the Enchuaning mine and the vessels mine simultaneously at the same time. So from the two different mining operations, and I find that quite hard to understand um, because those mines aren't mining the vugs at the border as such. They are underground. They are well apart. So it seemed a bit odd to me. And I often wondered in retrospect whether there was some disinformation um, to try and hide the exact locality. But anyway, chiselite, and I think these are probably some of the best of the species as well. And then obviously sugilite, um, the massive sugilite, which is polished into all sorts of objects de R, 
he has a piece of sugilite with the interbedded hematite showing some of the deformation. Sugilite crystals, extremely rare. They did occur, though. Getting the color right on a photograph with a digitally or film is a nightmare. Um, these are more or less true. And then this fibrous sugilite that came out from entwining three. But the best by far were the gemmy crystals. Uh, these are eight millimeters pure gem that came from the vessels mine associated with pictolite and calcite. Okay, shigite, um, during uh, Paul Ballier's time of mining for specimens during the early 2000s, he mined some shigite, and some it had come out before, but some of the better ones came out through his efforts, and this is on the cover of Minrek, and here's one for um, that was in German that we published in uh, the Lapis, Jens Kutzmann and I. Shigite has been known since 1993. This particular specimen is one of those old historic ones. Uh, and in fact, Cooper and Hawthorne used the Calari manganese field shigite to define the crystal structure um, of, of the species. I took a photo. I, I was really fortunate um, a couple of times to be able to um, work with Paul Bellier underground at the Entwining Mine when he was mining for the shigites uh, primarily and the Olmeites, and this is a picture I took at the face where they are busy working, and you can see here's the hanging wall, there's exposed, and you can see from the distance some of the vugs, some of these are full solid, but sometimes they obviously open up to allow the crystals to form. So here's a shigaite in a 3.9 centimeter vug, very commonly zoned and associated with the druzy pink rhodochrosite. A Paul Ballier specimen that he subsequently sold, 2.1 centimeter shigaite cluster, very tightly well formed on a pale pink rhodochrosite. This is a thumbnail uh, in my collection, a 2.8 centimeter composite crystal um, without matrix, but still a nice, a nice piece. And here's one on matrix composite intergrowth, um, perched on the rhodochrosite with the bearite crystal in front and smaller shigaites scattered along here. And yeah, up on surface is Paul holding what is, um, I believe, the finest shigaite. Look, one has never seen everything that has come out, but I've not seen any better. And you can just get a feeling of the size of the crystal. This is unclean as it came out of the mine that day. If you've got any in your collection, I don't know in the audience, but any of these assemblages of these particular shigaites, you might want to look at them carefully because we discovered a while ago that on very rarely on some of them and often on the back are these tiny brown acicular crystals. Notice this field of view is 2.2 centimeters. And we analyzed these and they are gate site, manganese phosphate associated with the shigaite rhodochrosite assemblage. So um, I have one and um, they, they, they must be out there, I think, and it would be useful for you to have a look at those if you have them. I've looked at all of mine very carefully, actually. <laughs> and then the last thing uh, before the type species, the Olmeite and the Poldefartite. This is the article published by Pagano et al. in the Minrec, where um, originally the Olmeites, when they came out in 2000, were thought to be poldephytite, and uh, they were, some of them were published as such, actually, but then um, Pagano and co-authors did further work, and they showed that, um, in fact, uh, they are Olmeite, which is the manganese analog of poldephytite, and this last line down here, the two species cannot be distinguished visually, so that is true. Um, you have to look at these things chemically now, so maybe some of the original poldephytites from vessels may be Olmeite. And again, some of the main, the best Olmeites came out through Paul's efforts underground. And here he is at the face. This happens to be at the Shigite face um, with some of, the, you can see some of the cavities here. Um, but the Olmeite was interesting. I've got a few slides to show you underground. Um, here you can see some of the cavities. There's a G pick for scale. And you see the spherical aggregates of Olmeite in situ. Yeah, that's the cream colored spheres. Yeah, again, uh, for scale. And what's interesting, here are two cavities, one above the other, and there are these sort of brownie, jemmy spheres above, and immediately below in this cavity are the more individual brown, chocolate brown crystals. So within very close proximity, there are different 
forms um, in, this, in, the, in, in the same face. These are some of the jemmy. Um, this is about um, eight centimeters, 10 centimeters jemmy ormeite with built fontaineite and little tiny sprays of the celestine. Now you can imagine this is in solid manganese ore and it's not easy to extract these without damage um, or, or perfectly. So I'd just like to quickly show you the great variety of ormeite, which still are. Um, I think there's another, there's one reported locality elsewhere in the world. Um, uh, I can't remember exactly where it was, but the bulk by far still pertain to the Kalahari. So here's like a bow tie, cream colored. This is very typical of the early ones. He has a sphere on matrix, a four centimeter ormeite sphere, and that's the true color. Some of these approach the red pink color of rhodochrosite, very rarely. He has four together. This one is bigger than a cricket ball, eight centimeters diameter. There's a very gemmy one with um, built fontaineite. He has chocolate brown ormeite. It's actually brown and overgrown by a thin coating of transparent ormeite. Here is a color zoned again with some almost like eyes on the points, six centimeters. And these crystals, which Paul mined, very, very nice composite crystals um, on matrix, a four centimeter crystal. Um, and then these that are nestling within calcite, also from a single pocket. And this association, 14 centimeters across of olmeite, also, which is nestling within uh, the light blue, the celestine. So that's the, the shigite and the olmeite from um, the basically 2004 uh, until about uh, 2008, I think, was when he was at the mine. Now, there are 28, these are the final things, uh, the 28 type locality species, which I'm not going to show you as of late September. But I thought, as this is an African symposium, maybe I'd show you the few that actually pertain to people in South Africa. And the first of these is von Betzingite which remains iconic to the Kalahari manganese field, the vessels mine, not found anywhere else to date. Ludi van Betzing here is a medical doctor retired in Kimberley, after whom the mineral is named. He acquired it and he recognized it as being something different and he sent it across and Diane Hollow then published it as a new species. And in fact, Ludi van Betzing has been instrumental in discovering several of the type locality species and of providing material to the researchers overseas who have then actually described them. Well, he has my namesake, if you like, Cairn Cross site. And in fact, I, I'm showing it also because Rudy von Betzing discovered it. He was collecting years ago on the old dumps at Hot as Hell, and he found this specimen, which looks a bit like white brucite. And it was on dumped material that was dumped at Hot as Hell Mine, but that had been transported there from the vessels mine. He, was, he managed to establish that. And he saw it looked a bit different. And uh, so he provided material to um, the researchers overseas, to Gista et al. And it became a new type species for the Kalahari. Then Colin Owensite, the barium copper silicate, one of the sugilite associated species. Colin Owen. Uh, deceased last year, but he was a mineral dealer living in Somerset West who had the original type material, who provided it. Uh, and then more recently, 2015, Tanya Yakawite, um, which was des uh, described by Yang, and it's named after the husband and wife team, <clears throat> mineral dealers who again have provided specimens to the collecting community worldwide, Tanya and Yako von Nuvenesen. It's these browny red crystals associated with the, with the sugalite assemblage. <clears throat> now, one needs to be careful. This is Tanya Yakawite, but there are others. There's ruizite, there's strontia ruizite, enomartanite, et cetera. So um, <clears throat> you need to analyze these things chemically to actually identify them. And one of the most recent ones is Sakawite, named after Desmond Sacco, the chairman of ASSEL. It's these fibrous yellowy green fibers. This is a 3.5 centimeter specimen associated with ettringite and andradite. And again, published by, by Giester. And you'll see here again von Betzing's name because he provided the original material yet again. And then finally, because of these type species, there's what's called the sugulite assemblage of minerals. There's a plethora of these 
in this particular assemblage. The amphiboles, garnets, olivines. But <clears throat> what I wanted to emphasize, the importance of the sugulite assemblage when it comes to the type species. Because 14 of the type species listed here come associated with sugulite and many from the vessels mine. Barium, copper, uh, the copper silicates, strontium, magnesium silicates, etc., cetera, and um, uh, some very recent ones which have just been published, the use of jangite and the hydroxymaglasonite have um, just recently been approved by the IMA. So the sugulite assemblage is really um, a powerhouse when it comes to producing these type of species. So I've just managed to show you, I think, some of the highlights. And I'd, I'd like to say that if you have access, um, we published an article uh, on the entwining mine, not vessels, but entwining in the Minrec in 2017, which has a lot of these things plus more. So if you have a copy of this or if you want one, you can read more about that. Or in more details, um, the two manganese books we've done over the years, both were sponsored by ASSO. Um, the one on the left, unfortunately, is out of print, but the one on the right is still available through the company in Johannesburg. So um, if you're interested to get more information, um, it is in there. And with that, I would like to thank you with the red sunset, which is mimicking uh, the rhodochrosites of the Kalahari manganese field. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm.